Again, my name is Annette Miller. Um, I'm with Equity by Design, where we believe that diverse voices should be in the center of decision making. We are a Madison based organization, um, and we're really proud um, to be a part of this um, facilitated conversation um, with a cross section and uh, all different walks of life here on this call. So super appreciative that people find that they need a space to be able to convene and talk. And I'm super excited about the fact that we've got some wonderful people who have some great perspectives um, about what we need to be thinking about in this uh, at, at this time. Um, I want to also get have a moment for us to recognize that the reason that we're here um, is because when it comes to social justice, when it comes to uh, racism, when it comes to people dying, that there is nothing that feels good about that. And we have to recognize that when we come together in a platform like this, that we're understanding that it is other people's bodies and it's people's bodies that are harmed um, in this movement and in this work. And so as we have conversations, as we have discussions, as we try together to co-create um, and feel our way through that we understand that it is real people, real lives, uh, real heartache, real pain um, that's at stake here. And so let's be mindful that this is very real and actively present for many of us um, in this space. And for others, they're trying to understand the impact of how this is real. And so I just wanna make sure that we understand that with the death um, and some with the death of George Floyd by the police that this is real and that we wanna make sure that we honor this space and we honor um, the work and we give it the respect um, that is due. And so with that, I wanna make sure that we take a moment to really center ourselves, that we take a moment to acknowledge that this is a space that we can be in together and I want us to take a moment to be sure that we can use our compassion and our empathy as we thoughtfully think through how can we lean in and move forward while acknowledging that there is a, a past that we also must shoulder and carry with us. So if we can take a moment to just take a deep breath in and take a deep breath out. That is a way in which we can help center ourselves and to center our hearts around this real work. And I appreciative that you're all here recognizing the importance of this moment. Yes, thank you so much for that, Annette. Um, I'm gonna do a quick tech check here. Those of you that are monitoring on Facebook Live, are we, is our audio coming through okay? It sounds like I'm getting some yeses. Yeah, I just checked it too. We're good. Okay, thank you so much. So I appreciate that centering, Annette. It's extremely important. Um, and I just wanna share from the Center for Community and Nonprofit Studies, you know, as a center that looks at social movements, civic engagement, community organizations, nonprofit organizations, advocacy organizations, we know that movements that have occurred throughout history require a, mu a multiplicity of actors and acts and influences. And so we're really excited today that we've been able to structure this discussion um, with a variety of change agents who do this work as their professional life, but sometimes just as citizens doing what they can to move the needle in certain ways. Um, and we also just wanna recognize all of you that are here that probably wear a variety of hats and are probably coming at this um, from a variety of perspectives. Um, from what we can tell from those that pre-registered, this is a pretty intersectional space with a lot of different identities involved in geographic locations. So we also wanna recognize that not everyone is experiencing this moment the same way. Um, and in this conversation, we're gonna really try to center black voices, um, which is important, especially at this moment in time. Um, and we're also gonna acknowledge that everybody has to find their personal way to be involved in um, a better future here and that's why we're all here. So thank you so much uh, for being here. Uh, what we're gonna do now is um, 
move through some themes and I'm gonna let Annette talk a little bit more about the themes. Um, and uh, the themes are also represented in a resource document that we're sharing as a part of this event too. And Annette, I'm going a little off script in our intro to speed it up a little bit, but Annette, okay. if you could share again with us a little bit more about how we're gonna move through the themes and how it's gonna work, then I think we can launch with, um, after you're hearing about that, we can launch a little bit with um, the first section. Absolutely. So what we wanted to make sure is that not only do we have an opportunity to listen and hear different perspectives, we want to give you an opportunity to be able to activate um, on that learning and that knowledge. So we broke this up into segments. Um, the first segment is learn, where we're really listening and trying to understand um, what's happening from different people's perspectives um, on what's brought us to this moment. So really thinking about what can we learn, what we, can we understand, and what do we need to know? Um, the next piece is taking care of ourselves. Um, this is a critical piece. Um, for those with lived experience um, operating um, with a racial construct and other um, identities, um, moments like these become very challenging and very hard um, to be able to put the mask on yourself while also trying to help others put the mask on themselves. And so what can we learn um, around taking care of ourselves and also thinking about how we can take care of others? The next piece will be exerting influence um, in our spheres of influence. So this is really thinking about how do we take what we learn um, and understand about where the work might be um, for each of us because it will be different. How do we take that knowledge and how do we activate it? How do we leverage it? How do we take it to the next level? So what does that sphere of influence look like and, and how can we um, build on that and exert that influence? And then the next piece will be support. So how do we support people who are doing the work? What do they need? What are they asking for? Um, and what do we have to offer and give in order to help them um, make good on the uh, work that needs to be done? And then most importantly, we hear this all the time, and I've been someone who said it myself, I'm tired of talking, let's start doing. What's the action? What, that's where the real work is. So now that we know, now that we understand, what is the action? So we'll be talking about how we can act and we're actually going to give you a document where you can make your own commitments around and through the work. Um, and then last but never least, if you're gonna, by acting, that is the way in which we leverage sustaining because with action, we give life um, to the work and with action, we can give life to sustain the work so that this isn't just a moment it is a moment in which we disrupt, we change, and we live in that new changed environment. And so we'll be talking about what does sustain look like from that lens. Um, I also just want to remind you all that you will not be satisfied with this conversation. It's going to go fast. We're going to want to talk deeply and more and longer with folks. We don't have the time. Um, but what this is, is a jumping off point to really think about what, how can we continue to convene and look more into doing this work together. Perfect, perfect. If you are not speaking, just, re just a reminder to mute your audio. Um, all right, I am gonna kick us off now with the learn section of our discussion today. And the very first thing that we are gonna get to learn about, which I am so excited about, um, is what, the movement looks like on the ground right now in a few different locations. One of the beautiful things about our center and our community of colleagues and uh, collaborators is that they are all over the place. And we've got some amazing people here with us today who are gonna give us like one minute updates of just highlights of what they're seeing in some of the places where this movement is happening. This movement is a global movement right now. Um, and we've got people here who can share with us a little something. I am gonna just mention that in Wisconsin, if you're visiting us from outside Wisconsin, uh, we're based at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and across Wisconsin from Milwaukee, which is our biggest city where there have been many, many protests on many, many days by many, many groups, including one led by the Milwaukee Bucks basketball team last Sunday, all the way down to smaller groups like the Mothers of Black Boys in Milwaukee that are hosting a vigil on Friday. 
Um, we're seeing an, inc an incredibly beautiful range of activities um, in our largest city of Milwaukee. And then even in our smallest communities, we see protests happening and demonstrations and gatherings happening in communities that are small and actually pretty homogenous. So you see um, that variety here in Wisconsin. And Madison itself has had quite a robust um, set of activities happening. And one of our um, recent graduates from our program, Tara, is going to mention what she's seeing in Madison. And then Lisa is here to talk about Minneapolis. Tara also has um, something to say about Minneapolis. And we might be joined by Yusra, who can also share about Minneapolis. And then from there, we'll move on to Ferguson by Felicia Pulliam and Camden, New Jersey um, from Stephen Danley. So if you all can remember that order and take turns and just give your brief update about what you're seeing from your lens in your location, that would be great. Tara, kick us off. Perfect. Um, can you hear me? Okay, awesome. So hi, y'all. I'm Tara. I, like Mary Beth said, I'm a recent graduate from the University of Madison in the Community and Nonprofit Studies major. Um, and I've been out doing a lot of activism work in the Madison area since things sort of kicked off on Saturday from the first protest in the afternoon to what happened and transpired later that night. Um, so just kind of to touch on some of the stuff that I've seen has been a really incredible learning experience seeing the ways that people have kind of adapted to the circumstances that we've been given. So seeing um, kind of going from the regular protests on Saturday before everything kind of went off with the guard and then seeing how people adapted after that to where people were bringing in things to help protesters. Um, people were bringing in waters, people were bringing in medical supplies, people were bringing in milk for things like mace and tear gas. People were adjusting because we were being told like, don't use milk for these things. Um, so it's been really interesting and really inspiring to see the ways that the community has really come together and seeing people that, you know, aren't comfortable with going out to protest or anything, like being like, where can I drop supplies off? And having groups of people that are out there like coordinating these sorts of things. Um, amazing like just organizing skills from people that just want to learn right off the bat I had uh, an experience on Sunday where because I know a little bit more about like organizing and your rights at protests where I was given the bullhorn because a bunch of kids were coming up to me and consistently asking they're like you're the one that knows the stuff about the rights right and I was like yes to some extent sure um, but really, and then, you know, as things moved on from Sunday, having these kids come up to me and being like, I did the research, like, I'm ready to talk to other people about this. I put stuff out on social media about it. Um, and then to just my own friends who bless them for everything that they've put up with me and, you know, housing me and like making sure that I'm safe when I'm out there, um, doing things like maps to show people like where, shots may have been fired with rubber bullets and all of these things and just really finding ways as a community to come together and like support and prepare each other and really giving this like center um, of support to the black organizations that are really leading all of this. And I just wanna emphasize that this is sort of like beyond our comprehension of like how amazing they have been at like so quickly organizing things, getting all of the like speaking and all of the events on Facebook out and really spreading the word and like making sure that the movement stays centered on the moment and what the current situation is and like figuring out ways to really encourage people to have conversations continuously. Fabulous, fabulous insights, Tara. Let's move on to Minneapolis. Um, Tara has some connections there, but I want to kick it off with Lisa. And if she's here, Yusra. Uh, bonjour, everybody. Um, my Ojibwe name is Youngling Swoman, and I am Martin Klan, and I'm from the Leech Lake Nation. However, I am currently residing in Minneapolis, and I'm uh, here at Ground Zero, have been part of the event since day one, I believe. And, you know, I guess as an update, today and yesterday, we are working on uh, really focusing ourselves with the American Indian movement and the American Indian community, focusing on um, working with the Black community, the Black leadership on defund the police, on um, rallying around support within the government and how do we work within the government to do to accomplish the goals and tasks that are set out there by both their community and ours as well. Um, 
Another thing that we're working on right now is looking at reporting of injuries and how do we how do we collect all of that data? How do we and what do we do with it? Um, many of our American Indian people in our community sustained uh, injuries from those riot those days of violence and and riots, uh, as well as some of the some of our uh, buildings and businesses as well. Um, we're also looking at um, continuing our work and negotiations with the Black leadership on, you know, what are, how do we, how does it look as far as community building and rebuilding and how do we establish and move on to, when you talk about defund the police, you talk about um, reinvesting in communities and what does that look like? So again, working within our community, working with our neighboring communities and cleaning up and repairing and beginning healing. Like last night, we had a community round dance kind of impromptu, but using our traditional uh, items, our, our drums and our songs and our dances to begin to heal. We, we held our dance right on Franklin and Cedar, right in the heart of our community, but um, also right in the point where many police and military march right through our neighborhoods. So you know, as we look to rebuild, we also have to look to heal. Thank you so much for these insights and for being here, Lisa. Felicia, would you share about Ferguson? Well, good afternoon, good people. I'm Felicia. Um, and so one of the things that I think is remarkably different this time around than in years past is um, activism in privileged areas, mostly white spaces, affluent areas in our community was met with surprise and resistance. And um, now <laughs> in some majority white spaces, having protest and march organized and led by white folk that were um, afraid, scared, had no knowledge, believed that they needed to be protected <laughs> from all of these black people and those few crazy white people that, that we don't know what they're talking about, what they're doing. Don't come over here. We don't have anything to do with this. And um, in the years since Michael Brown's murder, of course, there was a lot of organizing and protesting. It, it started right here. And We've got a lot of memory, a lot of talent, a lot of strength, and the ability to adapt very quickly. But for me, it is the realization that this is not our problem. This is not our problem. Um, amazingly, it has taken six years for people to understand how serious this issue is and if they're not actively resisting it, that they're complicit. And so when I see um, people protesting and marching in affluent areas and having resources and support and people you know, standing outside their mansions with Black Lives Matter signs, that's not something that ever, that I could have conceived of as a possibility. When, when we started this. Fantastic insight. And Felicia is gonna speak again at the very end about sustaining because as an organizer who not only has spent her life working on the issues that she cares about, but has been active in Ferguson since six years ago when Ferguson had its own Black Lives Matter protests. And she has worked through what comes after that with um, implementation of commission recommendations and things. So she's gonna be a great resource to us about how do you sustain efforts um, after the protests? Um, I'd like to turn to Stephen Danley for just a moment um, to share a little bit about what he's seeing in Camden, New Jersey. Camden has been on a lot of people's radar because it's one of the communities that has already been through a defunding process with its police department. But that, my understanding is that's much more complicated than it sounds. So I'm gonna turn it over to him to share some observations from there. Thank you. And first of all, I just want to say so inspired by so many of the faces here. Um, love learning from other folks in the struggle. 
were in Camden, New Jersey, um, through the looking glass. The police were disbanded in 2012. And what I want to say is um, be vigilant, because after an act like the disbanding of the police force here, there's a huge incentive to declare mission accomplished. What happened after our force was disbanded in 2012 is that we actually replaced it with a new force that increased officers on the ground. So we went from 268 officers in a small city to 413 officers in the first year of the new force. The new force embraced broken windows policing, um, stops for taillights being out went up over 400% in the first year of the new force. Um, and maybe to bring a little lightheartedness, stops for, um, riding a bicycle without a light or a bell went from three to 339 in the first year of the new force. I don't think it's super surprising to a group here, um, but that force um, then had more excessive force complaints in the immediate years after the new force was created. There's really good news though. Um, our activists stuck with it. Our local NAACP kept doing open records requests. We were marching and, and frankly, we were marching with Black Lives Matter folks um, through those years in 2014 and 2015 when there was a lot of heartbreak and folks here got excessive force changed. Um, those and those uh, excessive force guidelines here are some of the best in the country. You're required as an officer, if another officer is using force incorrectly or inappropriately, to, to disrupt that. And we've actually had police officers who have been fired because of inappropriate use of force. So there's hope, but it requires more organizing. And we're doing that here. We just had a march this past weekend in which we centered Black artists. So we had spoken word artists, we had hip hop artists at the rally on the steps of City Hall to do that. And uh, one last thought from Camden, New Jersey is for all of us involved in institutions, let's do our work at home. We started the conversation today to defund the Rutgers police because at my university, we have our own police force. So that's where we are here. And thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Stephen. Now, perfect segue. A lot of you, along with myself, are probably thinking right now, wow, these people are doing amazing stuff, but I'm just little old me. And I'm going to have Annette now lead us to what's one of the first steps that we can take any of us in this journey of being in engaged uh, work for racial justice and it's about learning it's continuing to learn not only about the actions that are happening out there but about other important resources and Annette's going to lead us through our next group of commentators who are going to talk about that thank you so much Mary Beth I really appreciate that so um great segue so first you've got to look to yourself um, you do not want to start throwing stones and rocks at other people if you don't have your own house in order. And when it comes to anti-racist work, when it comes to social justice work, we have all got to understand that we were socialized and normalized around a lot of information about what, what is true about people uh, places and things and associations have been made around race and around class and around gender. And so we have to unlearn that. I'm gonna say it one more time. We have to unlearn that. Not one person who is watching or listening on this call is exempt. Okay, so it's important that we get good information to help retrain our brain, retrain our thoughts, retrain how we understand the world. And it begins at self-education and looking at information in a, with a different lens. And so with that, again, to repeat and reiterate, there is a resource document that we put together with lots and lots of links. But just as much as we've got links for you to check out, we've got some wonderful people that I wanna introduce. We've got Langston Evans, who has some perspective about how we can think about the journey of learning. We've got Ruby Bafu, who um, works on restorative justice um, as part of the COM and S, and then is a sociology PhD candidate. And then we've got our own Karen Reese, who is a VP of Nehemiah and coordinator of a Black history class, which is one of many things that Nehemiah does. And so I want to first cue up Mr. Langston Evans to share with us from your perspective, what do we need to do in terms of sustained engagement around learning? Uh, thank you very much, Annette. It's a privilege for me to be here. Uh, again, my name is Langston Evans. And in my uh, day job, I work for the uh, Madison School District here in Madison, Wisconsin. 
Um, and I think this is a powerful moment. Um, this is a moment that feels in some ways like a hurricane that came out of nowhere. But learning is the way that we can sustain. Learning is the way that we can build roots. Um, and I think um, all of us come to this moment um, with different identities and different places that we hold. Um, and so for some of us, those identities seem uh, sort of straightforward. For other, others, they might be uh, complex uh, uh, and intersecting. And in many different ways, we have to figure out how do we engage and interact. Learning is the way to approach that. And I just want to give a few thoughts about how we might frame our minds about the information that we have. And then I'll turn it over to others that have information. But um, I want to reiterate the point that uh, Annette said, uh, retraining and unlearning is absolutely critical. Um, there's so much information out there. Uh, I want us to think about how we want to approach our learning with a couple of things. First, you have to have a personal perspective in mind. You have to have a goal for your learning. Um, you have to be able to explicitly state that. Um, you want to learn to understand systems and processes, not trivia. Not what happened 20, 30, 40 years ago for the sake of knowing it, but knowing how it shapes the world that we live in, knowing how it shapes the power uh, systems that are at play and how it actually forms the future. Um, learning with that purpose in mind actually gives us more power. Um, and we want to lead with our learning with inquiry and we want to lead with humility. Um, there's things where we're going to learn that we weren't told and we might actually learn why we weren't told those things. Um, and I want to think about the resources that we have. And there's a plethora of resources. Um, we want to make sure that we're actually identifying the whole system of systemic oppression that we're learning from so that we're not just picking from one aisle in the grocery store. While broccoli is great, uh, if we only eat broccoli, uh, it's not healthy. And in order to understand a system that's interconnected between personal lives, institutions, and overall multinational systems of control, we have to understand the full gamut of that system. Um, and so I want us to think about it in a couple of different ways. But the first is, what kinds of things should we be learning about? And Annette hit this first is individual. Uh, what is our individual privilege and purpose? We can't address the rest of our learning until we understand ourselves, our privilege, our perspective, and our unconscious bias. And those aren't our faults, but it is our opportunity to unlearn those. Um, secondly, what are our interactions with others? Not only interactions with others in groups that are not like ours, with identities we don't share, but how are we interacting with the people who have identities that are similar to ours? What do we learn about what the power is in those interactions? And then thirdly, are we getting understanding and learning about institutions and larger structures? We want to make sure when we approach learning that we're really sampling from all of those areas, uh, starting with ourselves. Um, we want to think about what are the knowledge, the skills, and the experiences that we want to bring to this? How are we learning? Are, what do we have to do uh, to learn about ourselves that we want to do by ourselves? How, how are we engaging in the information? Uh, what is independent? What is group work? When do we need a class and what are we using that class for? Um, and what is learning that we actually are doing things? What is political action as learning and how do we define that? Um, and then uh, I just want us to know that there's so many things out there, but I wanna go back to something that my uh, high school English teacher said is that we have to apply the crap test. Um, and the crap test is this, uh, is the resources that we're sampling from, are they current? Uh, are they relevant and reliable? Uh, who's actually writing it? Who is telling you this story? And what perspective is that story coming from? I invite people to learn the same story from multiple perspectives because that gives us the multiple stories that create our world. Um, and so with that, I will pass it over to Ruby. All right, Ruby. Awesome. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Awesome. So hello, everyone. I'm Ruby Bafu, a graduate student here in Madison. And my research looks at how Black girls experience school punishment. So essentially what I'm interested in is how school punishment practices shape how Black girls understand themselves in terms of their racial and gender identity. 
I'm so honored to be on this panel today to offer perspective on how we might respond to recent events and anti-Black racism in general, given my positionality as a Black woman researcher. Um, so I want to start off by offering some background on my research, and then I'll go ahead and offer advice about how to engage in racial justice. So I interview Black girls who attend Amy Public Middle or High School in Dane County to learn more about their school experiences. But unfortunately, my work was interrupted by the COVID-19 pandemic, which we all know too well. So instead of collecting interviews this summer, I've been reading newspaper articles to get a sense of what Black girls have been experiencing in Dane County schools. And one of the things that I've learned from reading these newspaper articles has to do with the change in discourse around policing and punishment, particularly around what it means to have cops in schools. So just this week, Madison 365 released an article about how the Madison Metropolitan School District plans on removing school resource officers from school buildings. And this occurred about a week or so after the Minneapolis School Board um, severed its relationship with the police department three days after the death of George Floyd. So I'm really happy to hear that our own local school district plans to remove cops from schools. But my research using news articles, in addition to my own experiences living in Madison, remind me that this decision only came after years of hard work, emotional labor, and organizing from community leaders here in Madison. So I want to lift up the work of folks from Freedom Inc, Urban Triage and other community organizations here in Madison that have consistently fought to protect black youth and particularly black girls. So for the past two weeks, I've watched community organizers, particularly black women, organize protests and put together gatherings for black members of the community to simply breathe and exist. And for the past two years that I've lived in Madison, I've watched folks from Freedom Inc. and members of the community take up space at school board meeting, after school board meeting, demanding that the school board be held accountable for protecting black youth by removing cops out of schools. The purpose of me highlighting the efforts of black women in particular is to ensure that these women aren't erased. If there's anything that I've learned from living in Madison, it's that Madisonians pride themselves in being liberal. The issue is that white liberalism often makes us focus on the victories that have been won while ignoring the efforts that it took to get there. So based off that, um, here's the advice that I want to offer <laughs> for those who are committed to racial justice and want to engage in the lifelong learning that's acquired to disrupt the ways in which white supremacy shapes society. So one, I would say protect and uplift black women, girls, gender nonconforming and queer folks because these are the people who are on the front lines fighting for racial justice. These are also the people who are arguably some of the most vulnerable when it comes to violence. So watch out for us, ask us how you can support us and be ready to hold space for our needs and uplift us by truly looking out and listening to us. Two, I would say that you should show up in real time. This is all part of the learning process. So again, folks from Freedom Inc. and other community organ organizers consistently showed up at school board meetings, took up space and made, uh, made demands. So I'd advise you to stay updated on what's occurring in your community and ask folks how you can support. So that can mean donating posters with protest slogans on it. It can mean donating food, donating money to local organizations or bail funds, or really just asking how you can be helpful. I think there's a multitude of ways to show up. So really just ask and you will receive. Three, I would say that you should apply pressure with own, within your own networks. And once you're done, continue to apply more pressure. So for example, there's a lot of undergraduate and graduate students who are writing letters to their departments or people who work at companies who are writing letters to their CEOs, whatever it is, about them making statements to address um, the movement that we're seeing across the nation, right? So apply pressure. And when your company or when your organization puts out a statement, ask them how they're holding themselves accountable to actually do what they're saying, um, actually do what they say that they're doing. And if you feel compelled to write a letter to somebody or make a certain call to action, join with other people, but make sure that there's accountability throughout that process. The last thing that I would say, since we're talking about learning, is that you should do the work of learning, but be ready to deal with frustration. So as a researcher, I spend so much time on the library website or on Google Scholar. Um, and really all I do is just open up my laptop and I just go straight to Google. Now I want to acknowledge that there's a lot of privilege in being an academic because I've been taught how to do research. But whether you're a researcher or not, taking time to learn about issues that you're unfamiliar with isn't as scary as you think. It really is just a Google search. But I want to stress that like 
you need to be comfortable with your own frustration, but the frustration of others, particularly Black people during this time. Learning and unlearning racism is very hard, but it also is frustrating as a Black woman to constantly ask, well, what can I do? How can I learn? I promise Google will help you. I promise that Google Docs, such as the ones that we've created, really do help. There are books out there. There are people who have been writing about these things and have made it um, their life commitment to learn about these things. So I would definitely recommend doing the work because the resources are out there. And I'll stop there. Ruby, thank you so much. So I just want to say that it's amazing how you took like every theme and smashed it into your talk point. So <laughs> thank you. Um, there was a little bit of everything in your statements that are so on point and very real. And I also am excited to have Kieran Reese come up and now share with us from her perspective what we need to be thinking about in terms of learning because Nehemiah and the work that they've been doing, they've been front and center on this work as well. So Kieran, tell us what's going on? What do we need to know? Yeah, thanks, Annette, and everyone who's given some really good suggestions so far. Nehemiah is a Black-led organization that's been in Madison, Wisconsin for nearly 30 years now, and our mission is simple. Um, we want to build a stronger Madison for all, and we do that by focusing on strengthening the Black community and Black families. And we do, um, we focus both on direct service um, with K-12 through leadership, self-identity, self-esteem, that sort of thing, and also with re-entry, so people who are getting out of jails and prisons. But we also feel it's very important to focus on systems change. And we do this through our initiative called Justified Anger that started uh, in 2014. And for this work, we wanna push in different areas. So for example, criminal justice, education, um, economic development, family and community wellness, to figure out how the powers that be can work together to actually move the needle. So we're not talking about programs that just change um, individuals, which is very, very important and needed, but how do we make real systems change? And that's um, something that just takes a long time to do. A very critical piece of that is, again, learning. And so we have training opportunities for allies. Uh, the majority of people that take our Black history class are white allies in um, the greater Madison area, and we've had people from Janesville um, and, and very far away come and take the class. And we focus on uh, history that, that many of us have not learned, even in grade school, but even in colleges, we've had people who have PhDs in history who have not learned Black history in our country. And so when white people try to understand racism and try to understand what we can do, we have no context for why racism exists. We know it exists. We know about personal feelings. We know, usually we know something about unconscious bias, but we don't know about the systems and the structures and the institutions that perpetuate these things. So this class, um, so far we've been able to take 250 people each year. We've trained over a thousand people in this area. And we start from civil rights, or I'm sorry, we start from pre-slavery Africa because we want people to understand that um, there was something before Black people came to America. Um, a lot, there was a lot before that. But usually in our history classes, we just start with slavery. Um, we move through slavery, but we talk more about economic impacts. We talk about the development of the concept of race. Um, in other words, there was a time when people referred to as Christian versus non-Christian. And then we started to see interracial relationships and that's when we started to see words like white, words like black come into play. We talk about how race was a very specifically constructed concept and how it was woven into the fabric of our country and the racial dynamics became, our country became dependent on them to make our economy work. That's how our economy was built. Um, we go through about the civil rights period in this nine week history class. And then um, we offer other opportunities throughout the year for people to engage, um, to learn what's happening today, to use what they've learned to figure out what they can do in their own spheres of influence to make change. Um, we work with them, but we also empower people to use their own knowledge, their awareness of themselves to figure out what they personally can do, whether that's writing letters, whether that's showing up for a protest, um, whether that's donating if they're financially privileged, um, whether that's making changes in their HR department. So we really kind of help guide people to that, but building that capacity so that lots of times what happens is, um, as Ruby was saying, 
white people are asking, you know, tell me what to do. Well, we're going to tell you what the context is and then you can figure out what to do. And as long as we're sort of keeping in touch um, and maintaining, making sure that you're following the leadership of uh, black leadership, then you're going to be okay. You're going to make mistakes. That's fine. Everyone does it. Just recalibrate and keep it moving. And so, like I said, we've trained over a thousand people in the greater Madison area. And um, that's resulted in a number of different contracts with, with school districts and corporations and faith communities. And we're hoping to just to keep expanding that so that we can really um, contribute to this cultural change. So unlearning the myths that we've learned about who our country is and where we came from, relearning the truth, and then becoming adjusted and walking with dignity in making things right. Wow. So as we said, a lot to know, a lot to understand, and always dissatisfying because we've got to keep moving on. But I also want to just echo that we've got to learn, we've got to give grace to ourselves. And when you get uncomfortable, that's when you lean in more. You don't lean off and take off the gas, foot off the gas. You lean in more and you push yourself more to disrupt the pain and the discomfort that you're feeling. So I really appreciate you all sharing with us what learning looks like. So with that, what's up next? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll take the next section and, and thank you all who helped us with the learn section of this agenda. We're getting some questions on comments on Facebook about can we post a list of our presenters and we'll get back to everybody about that in some way, shape or form. I can tell that people are inspired by those that are speaking here today. Um, so the next thing we need to talk about is to Annette's point, no matter who you are, even if all you're trying to do is learn more from your white identity about the things that you don't understand and you're trying to figure out about how to get engaged or whether you're a person of color watching systemic violence on the TV or experiencing oppression on a daily basis and racism on a daily basis, we need to take care of ourselves in this process. And I am certainly not the first, first person um, to talk about this. Audre Lord said that caring for myself is not self-indulgence, it is self-preservation, and that is an act of political warfare. So this idea of taking care of ourselves so that we can be the best that we can be in this lifelong process is something we want to talk about now with a couple of our dream team folks on the call. So I'm just going to do a quick check. I think we've got Corinda Rainey Moore here. I'm not sure if we've got Eric Upchurch. And then I think we've got Rosa Thompson. So the three, those are our three people and, and that's giving me the thumbs up. And I'm gonna just each let you go in order. Corinda, Eric, Rosa, um, and we're gonna keep it pretty brief, but the question that we'd like you to look at or comment on rather is how can we take care of ourselves and others as needed as a key part of our plan for sustained engagement? Understanding that we're not all experiencing um, the same difficulties in this process. So Corinda, mind kicking us off? Um, hello, um, thanks everyone, and I appreciate being here. So when I think about how do we take care of ourselves and others, it's really uh, knowing yourself and knowing what you need in order to be whole and healthy. And what that's going to look like is not going to look the same um, for all of us because we all have different needs and we all are affected by things in different ways. So for me, when I think about taking care of myself, I think about what kinds of things make me happy um, and what kinds of things do I enjoy doing. And so uh, when I think about the kinds of things that I enjoy doing, I enjoy, um, I have a dog collection, so I collect dogs. I enjoy spending some time with my family, um, which um, includes my grandkids. I enjoy reading books. So I belong to a sister group. Um, I also pray a lot and I meditate a lot. Um, and so those are the kinds of things that I do to, to, to help me when I'm thinking. But the other thing that I also wanna talk about um, is too that for us, I, oftentimes we are hesitant and reluctant to seek help outside of ourselves. Um, and whether that is asking somebody else for help or reaching out uh, for help uh, from a clinician or a therapist. And what I want folks to, to know is that um, when you think about um, historically, what we've been told is to ask for help is a weakness. But if you actually think about how hard it is to really ask somebody for help when you're not used to it, that takes a lot of strength and a lot of courage. So I actually view it as a strength um, to be able to reach out and ask folks for what you need 
and to be able to go out and get therapy if that's what you need. Now, not every therapist is going to be, uh, may, may not work for you, um, but you don't give up. You keep searching and keep reaching out until you find one that does um, really work for you. It's the same as when you think about when you go to a doctor for a medical appointment. When you go for a medical appointment, sometimes the doctors don't always connect with you. Sometimes um, they don't listen. So what do you do? You, get, you keep looking until you find a doctor, um, particularly, and if need be, you get second opinion. And so therapy is no different than that. Um, you keep looking until you find one that works for you. And um, if you don't like what they told you or what they, how they've diagnosed you, then you go and get a different one or get a second opinion. Um, so I would say treat it that way. Um, we as uh, folks of color have to continue to um, support each other. And that support is going to look differently. And some people like to say, treat other people as you like to be treated. My rule is to treat other people the way they wanna be treated because we're all individuals and we all have different needs. So reaching out and giving somebody what they need versus what you think they need. And the only way to do that is to ask people and to take the courageous step to reach out and ask folks for what they need and for what they want. Well, Corinda, thank you so much. Those of you that don't know Corinda, she is herself a PhD holding mental health professional and also involved in just about everything I can imagine in Madison. So I would listen to her because she's kept this work up for a long time and she's very professionally qualified. <laughs> Let's thank turn you. to Eric and then Rosa for their comments on what we can do to treat ourselves and others. Okay, sir. What's up, everybody? Um, so, Thank you for having me. Um, I got my three-year-old uh, in his transformer costume here, so you might you might see him pop through. But I'm I'm gonna try to be brief because so much, uh, so many good things have been shared already. Um, but so I just want to start off by saying that self-care is definitely revolutionary. It is a part of the movement work. It is as important as showing up on the front lines. Give, give me one second, son. Um, and I want to talk about, he's, he, this is a motor car in the background, just, just so you know, it's an actual motor car. But um, anyways, um, uh, awareness, I want to talk about well-being as a function of um, wellness or, or awareness, introspection, um, uh, purpose, and connection. And Really, the awareness part comes from, this is coming from the Center for Investigating Healthy Minds. Dr. Richie Davidson talks about this. Um, and a little bit of why I study this is coming from my work in collaboration and my work in the movement. So a lot of my work has come from uh, the need to really connect with people and to give folks what they need in, in order to overcome whatever barriers there are to connecting with each other and to getting to the goal. And a lot of times that means that we have to deal with some interpersonal things and a lot of our challenges are internal as well. Um, and what this, this function of well-being kind of contemplates is that if we are, are present in the, in the present moment, it's kind of cliche to talk about, but if we're in the present moment, um, we tend to have a higher feeling, a higher sense of well-being, rather than dwelling in the rather than dwelling in the future or dwelling in the past, um, worrying about something or um, um, reminiscing or you know lamenting about something. Um, the other thing with introspection, is, so there, I'll talk about real quickly in a second about some tools to stay present, to be in the in the present moment, because it's kind of cliche to just say that. Uh, but introspection is a favorite of mine because it kind of makes clear that we are not our thoughts. We're not our thoughts any more than we are what we smell, than we are what we see, than we are what we hear, like the siren that some people could identify themselves with this siren and it, you know, the siren's going off all the time for them. And that's how we treat our thoughts. We identify them in such a meaningful way that we kind of get wrapped up into them rather than just experiencing them as we do smells or sounds or sights. Um, and when we're able to kind of have that distance between our thoughts and who we truly are, it allows us to become that much more curious and aware of ourselves and gives us a little bit more presence and awareness with other people. Uh, 
the other part is connection. Just plan on being connected with people. We need people. If a baby is born and not touched, it will die. And granted, we're all kind of experiencing levels of distance right now, um, but having spaces like these where we're connecting with individuals, having someone where you feel connected, and that can be something that you intentionally just invoke within yourself, even if it's just reading a good story that for about someone that you relate to, but you have to foster that connection. Um, and, and lastly, with the, these four pillars of, a, of well-being is a purpose. And I talk about purpose, especially in movement work, because we get so wrapped up in the end goal and what we think is victory. It, it's almost like we hinge our sanity on the idea of a victory that may or may not come. And if it does come and it's not what we hoped it would be, then we kind of salty, you know? So um, I like to emphasize purpose over process. And one of the greater purposes for myself that has kept me sane, if I'm speaking from, you know, for myself and from my own experience, it's kind of relinquishing, uh, some of y'all might not like this, but I truly believe it's revolutionary and necessary. It's relinquishing the, the end goal. And not, that's, that's not saying, let's just give up the idea of liberation. But what it is saying is it's welcoming how big this picture is and knowing that if I can just become a better person along the way and help other people to get a little bit better along the way, that's a win. Being able to celebrate those wins, the little wins beyond and before the big quote unquote goals that we have is uber, uber important. And it helps with our resilience when things come up and it looks like we might not be able to do that thing. Well, at least we're overcoming a challenge that's 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 getting us closer to who we want to be in the world. So, really quick, some some brief tools because I'm sensing that I'm running over time, and I know there's so much to share here, so many great people to hear from. Um, the natural breath—that's just letting your body naturally breathe for you. Tuning into that builds awareness. It, it decreases stress. Um, tuning into your bodily bodily sensations. When it comes to your feelings. Um, under, getting curious about what meanings and associations you have that are supporting the feelings that you're that you're experiencing, um, listening from your own needs and also from other people's needs, and then lastly, with resilience, understanding that everything is going to change, that the challenge that we're going through can be something that's a challenge, but it can also be something that's really making me a better person. And I've I've developed kind of a, a slightly insane perspective that allows me to get crazily excited about a challenge rather than it just being a barrier. So the thing that is my weakness becomes my strength. And then lastly, there's gratitude. Being thankful for even the small things, it, it will fuel you and it will fuel your team. And, you know, of course I wanna share more, but there's so much more for us to hear. So thank you for, for listening. Thank you, Eric. Always wonderful to hear from Eric. And I just want to reiterate that we are going to be trying to create opportunities to bring these folks back and share information about them and their work with you. Eric is involved in a lot of things, but he's the founder of Opportunity Inc. You can look him up, Eric Upchurch. Rosa Thompson now, founder of Black Girl Magic Conference based in Madison, Wisconsin. What can you share with us about taking care of ourselves and others? Hi, I'm Rosa Thompson. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the others, caring for the others, so the youth in your life. I'm an um, educator in MMSD, so um, the kids is what I usually deal with. Um, so, oh, I'm sorry, and there's one kid. <laughs> um, so, kids often show stress in many different ways. Um, so, it's really important to be aware on how your child shows stress and, or, how they need, or, or how they show that they need care. So they may withdraw, they may lose interest in their regular activities, um, they may show fear or cry. So it's important to be in tune to your kids, the kids in your life to know what they need because it might not be what you may expect it to be. It might be that they don't wanna read a book with you anymore. They wanna spend more and more time in their room and just withdraw. So really just being aware of what your child needs. Um, because as we know, kids internalize things more than we might think they do. They see more than we think they do. You know, even though we say, oh, we're gonna shield them from these things um, that are going on, they see it. They see it, it pops up, um, whatever they're watching, their friends talk to them. And it's important to really have real frank conversations 
with what they're seeing and then address those fears or um, anxiety that they might have around um, the issues that are going around. Um, and then um, another thing is just part of our resistance, part of um, being a black person is is the joy that we have and really capitalizing that that we find some joy in what we have going on i know a lot of us um you know we have books on the struggle and the civil rights which are all very very important but also remember to p position those books against books about black joy about innovators about art about the celebration of our culture because our culture is about resistance it's about joy and we have so much of it within our culture and um, it's important to take care of yourself, yourself, your kids, kids, you know, they see what you do as your parent, as the adult in your household, they model what you do. So take care of yourself, which includes your mind, your body and your spirit. For our kids that might look like going outside, um, writing in a journal, riding your bike, um, meditating, doing some mindfulness, singing, dancing, affirmations that you can find, you know, in books online and just really just loving yourself um, and taking care of our kids. Cause like I said, as we know, um, our kids are internalizing everything that's going on. Fantastic, thank you so much. And um, I think people can find Black Girl Magic Conference info online if they Google it and find out more about your work, right? Yes, we're online at the blackgirlmagicconference.com. Perfect. Um, and perfect segue. Thank you for mentioning that, you know, the taking care of kids and those in our immediate sphere of influence. I'm going to turn it over to Annette now to talk a little bit about that. You know, where can we have an impact just in our own intimate circles, family, community, neighborhood, workplace? Annette? Yeah, so thanks. Um, what I want to start out by saying is that you give up power when you think you have no power. You give up your power when you think you have no power. As an individual, no matter whether you're in your neighborhood, you're at your school, at work, at the grocery store, at the movie theater, taking a walk, you have agency, you have power, and you have to start there because that is what exerting your influence of power is all about. It's understanding that you are not small. You might physically feel small. You might emotionally feel small. You might mentally feel small, but you have bigness oops, within you. Um, and so understanding that you have power, that you have agency is huge in this work. And we have a couple of speakers, Precious Woodley, we have Nasra Wahili, and then we also have Hi. you. I am, uh, there is not, okay, I'm so sorry. And um, also we have Yusra Murad, who is gonna share with us their perspective. And the question is, we have everyday influence. And so what does that look like with family and friends and neighborhoods and neighbors? What does that look like in our community of networks? How do we um, leverage that influence? And so what I wanna do is have Precious Woodley speak first, and then I will have Nazra Wahili speak, and then Yusra Murad, and I might chime in at the end. Precious? We might have to bounce to the next person. Just okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so Nazra, can you share with us your perspective on how you leverage um, your spheres of influence? Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. It's a really privilege to be with this uh, uh, group of people, and I, it's a privilege, and I'm glad I am here today. So, just to give you a little background, you know, I was told to talk about the influence in regards to organizations. So, I have been in Madison for the last 30 years, and a person of Muslim, Black woman, immigrant, I have a lot of intersectionality and work with different organizations whether they are business or whether they are nonprofit. And the lens I want to talk about this afternoon is the lens of empathy. You know, a lot of organizations talk about equity, inclusion, and, uh, uh, and diversity, equity, and inclusion, but they stop there. So how can we be very intentional in moving forward in providing the space 
the people of color or, or diverse uh, communities who work in the workplace that they have the space to thrive and be successful. So the empathy, I know you have been hearing a lot of, uh, it's in the lips of everyone, politician, businesses, and so forth. So how we can have an empathy lens. And for the sake of time, I have, uh, you know, what I, you know, I worked with nonprofit and now I'm seg um, uh, shifting my, my, my focus into business in consulting where I can be help organization build culture of uh, empathy. And it has, you know, like the three, three uh, legs. One is the purpose, how you make alignment with purpose, uh, policy, and also practice. So organization needs to be very intentional in terms of providing, uh, and one of the ways to do that is increasing equity within the organizations and the community they serve. So you already have the uh, equity and inclusion lens, and this lens will give you another layer. So have the purpose, what's your purpose as organization with what's going on with the world? You know, like Eric and other people alluded to this, it's a transformational movement. It's a, uh, what's called the revolution. So we cannot be left behind. So how we can be very intentional and in providing the space that's needed for our people or, or the diverse uh, communities. Secondly is the policy, how you create an inclusive, just respectful environment for the people of color, advocating for equity inclusion approach, understanding how systemic discrimination threatens the fairness and the employee's morale, understanding the implicit bias. So, you know, you have, uh, purpose, and then you have the policy, and then finally, how you align those two areas with the practice. And practice is cultivating curiosity. When you have diverse employees, you don't just assume that, you know, I'm not racist, I have a black employee, or I, you know, we have diverse employees, but you don't do any work in bringing those employees together. So curiosity, expand you know, connecting with other diverse, you know, people, talking to your circle outside uh, your uh, businesses or your circles, and then challenge your prejudice uh, and discover commonalities. We have a lot of differences, but we have also a lot of uh, uh, similarities. So acknowledge that similarities and have that conversation. Also inspiring the social justice change. So now it's a transformational, it's, it's a big movement. Don't be left behind. Be intentional in, in engaging conversation. Listen to employees and be intentional and also engage in the conversation. A lot of leaders, you know, try to uh, stay away from the critical conversation when it comes to race and culture. So be intentional and have that openness and that in uh, um, conversation. And I know, you know, I for the sake of time, I would like to go more deeper. But those are the areas and you know, one area that I can deep dive into more is the how you monitor the progress. And uh, so that those are the areas I will be focusing on in terms of the empathy and building those, uh, you know, employee morale and productivity. Thank you so much, Nazra. I really appreciate your insight and perspective on this. Um, you bring much to the conversation. Um, I just found out that um, unfortunately, um, Precious is not on the line and she would have covered um, information around how do you talk to kids about race and racism. And so refer to the resource list um, for additional information since she was unfortunate, since Precious was unfortunate uh, in not being able to attend. And so how I want to further and round out this conversation is when we think about spheres of influence, and how we exert influence, we have to acknowledge our fear and we have to acknowledge our worry about not saying it the right way, doing it the right way. And you have to grab onto that and understand that though you may be afraid, you're gonna say it wrong or you're gonna communicate it wrong, or maybe you're just afraid because of the consequences of speaking up and speaking out you need to lean in through that fear and grab onto courage. And you need to lean in and grab onto social justice. You need to understand that change won't come unless you're willing to be a part of the change. As long as you stand 
and silent and worried and afraid, you are being complicit. So what you have to do is you use your courage and you speak up and you don't have to say something wild and crazy. You can be in a meeting and you can hear somebody perhaps dismiss another person's idea or comment. And you lean in and you say, you know, I just wanna acknowledge that I heard um, Tracy talk about this um, topic that you just brought up. And I think it's a great connection that um, the both of you are thinking about this in the same way. That is using your sphere of influence. When you're at home and you hear a family member or a friend say something about a particular group of people, you have to lean in and say, you know what, in my house, that's not how we talk. Or in, in, in with me present, I would appreciate it if you not speak about people in that way. I have come to learn a lot about that particular group and I don't think that it's appropriate nor is it right to be speaking in that way. And I would appreciate it if we could no longer talk about people in that manner. And you have, and what it does is it starts letting people know that they don't have the space to be able to air inaccuracy or air prejudice or air bias. And so you start with your fear. You start with your fear and you lead with your courage and you say what needs to be said. You don't have to yell it or scream it. And sometimes another way of using your power and your influence is by saying, I'm sorry, I cannot be complicit in this conversation. I don't think it's appropriate. And so I'm going to remove myself from this conversation and I'm happy to participate in this conversation when we change the narrative. So I'm going to leave now because I do not wanna empower you to continue this kind of dialogue that is not inclusive and welcoming. That is what you start doing. And you'd be surprised at how that moment can be so transformative, not only for you, but for other people who also too wanted to express that, but didn't know how. That's how you model it. And when you leave, then you can shake and go, I can't believe I just did that. That was super scary, but that'll be the worst that it will be. The next time with practice and with learning, it gets better. And so exer exercise your agency, exercise your voice, don't be complicit. And again, use the resources, including the Google, uh, to help you learn um, about how you can use your voice and be powerful in those moments. Because sometimes when you acknowledge someone else's oppression, you've done much for that individual. So with that, I think we're gonna to go to the next topic, which yeah, is- I'm gonna work. jump in for one second because one of Precious's oh. colleagues um, oh. in, the, in the same field, um, and one of our, she's a graduate student of ours, Paula Drew, is at least just gonna kind of flag what those resources are because she knows a lot about those resources. So let's just take 30 seconds and let Paula refer to those ever so briefly. Excellent. Oh, she's on Facebook Live. She's texting me. So anyway, I guess what we're really <laughs> going to do is say, um, please do check out the resource list. Um, thanks, everyone, for your patience with this um, process. Um, but I think the takeaway there is there are tons of resources for preparing the next generation of children, whatever perspective or identity they are coming from, um, to have better um, preparation for this world and to advance an anti-racist um, next generation. And so please do refer to that list. And we will be bringing in folks on that topic to the next um, version of this um, event next week if you're wanting to tap in there. Um, so we're going to recover a little time here. The next stage, you know, just as a reminder, what we've been doing here is working through these themes of how to prepare ourselves for sustained engagement for racial justice. And what we're going to talk about now in that progression is support and supporting organizations that are doing the work already, okay? And so as a Center for Community and Nonprofit Studies, I would say on a daily basis, we're just amazed and in awe of the variety of efforts going on out there in the grassroots community and nonprofit sector related to making this world better and specifically around racial justice. 
We're gonna recover a little time here by just doing an interactive activity. We're gonna ask you all who are fired up about an organization you see doing good work to drop that name of that organization in the chat. And we're gonna collect those and make sure that they're in our Google Doc. So we're just gonna take a very brief moment to um, acknowledge that there are people already out there doing this great work and we can all support them with our dollars, our time and our treasure um and raising awareness about their work and lifting them up so let's just all take a moment we're going to do a non-talking moment here and everybody just pop some ideas in the chat we'll record them you can keep it going even after we start the next section so we'll take a beat here So a very simple thing that all of us can do, whether it be $5 or $500, is consider supporting those that are already doing the work, that are already organized around the work. Um, and the great thing is you don't have to be, um, there doesn't have to be consensus about which organizations to support. You can choose the organization that resonates with you. Um, I'm gonna allow my colleague, Amy Hilgendorf, to just say one thing about her experience with um, as a white ally, finding an organization or a couple of organizations that helped her and others that are involved with these organizations to activate um, from their particular perspective, if Amy, you're still willing to do that. Sure, I'll just mention um, a couple of organizations that are here in Madison, um, specifically for white folks who are interested in engaging in anti-racist work and um, want to do that with other white folks. Um, accountability is really important uh, as a white person uh, engaged in anti-racist work. So I don't uh, suggest that this be the only way that you do your anti-racist work, but there are conversations um, that uh, white folks can have with other white folks that are really valuable too. So um, I'll share links as well, but Groundwork is an organization that's been in Madison for a long time uh, for white people to learn about racial justice and to uh, encourage each other to participate in actions and do donations, um, redistribution to organizations led by people of color. Uh, and related work. Um, Families for Justice is another organization um, that I'm involved in and uh, similarly in uh, engage in a lot of anti-racist work uh, as white folks um, and raising children as well. Um, and then there's also uh, witnessing whiteness groups, which are educational spaces uh, for people to better learn about um, whiteness and white supremacy and um, to talk with others about that as well. Uh, the Justified Anger Group, I'll give another shout out to them, uh, as well as the Institutes for Healing Racism also. Um, I have connections with all those groups, so <laughs> if you want a, a warm handoff, um, please feel free to reach out to me. And I want to just reference for those of our audience who are in different geographic locations that the Standing Up for Racial Justice group is a national organization and there are chapters all over the country. You can usually find the chapters by just searching on Facebook for those groups. So Standing Up for Racial Justice. So thanks, Amy. I'd just like to add to Catalyst is a national organization that also has a, a lot of resources and learning opportunities for um, white folks as well. Okay, so we're going to track all your responses about the great organizations to support and get those back out in our Google Doc and we hope you'll be inspired today to make a donation to one that resonates with you. And now um, Annette is going to take us through how to set an action plan for our continued engagement going forward and we're going to run a little over I think but we definitely want to create some space at the end to hear from Felicia and Lisa about sustaining efforts from their experience in longtime work in Ferguson in Minnesota. So Annette, yeah. um, go ahead with the action. 
All right. So we've been talking, right? And so now it's ready to do. So what that looks like is we've dropped a link to a document that is actually just a, a way to organize um, your intentions of how you want to make change for yourself and how that change for yourself can then be bridged to how you can help and take care of others and how you can help and take care of the community and also support other organizations and change agents. And so what this document does is each of the themes that we have talked about today, the learn, the taking care of ourselves, exerting influence, support, um, and sustain are all in the document. And what we ask you to do and what we call you to do is to think about today, what is one action today that I'm going to make in each of those categories. So what am I going to do today to make sure that I learn and understand what I need to know about what I previously did not know? What am I going to do today to take care of myself and others? What am I going to do today to exert influence and be in space to make sure that I can help families and friends, the community network? What am I gonna do today to support friends and organizations and the change and the change agents so that we can make sure that this work stays strong for the long haul. And what actions am I going to take each day to reaffirm uh, the work that I'm committed to and the work of others. And so if you can do this, you are in essence sustaining the work. So what is it you're going to do today? What is it you're going to do this week? What is it you're going to do for the month? What are you going to do between July and August? What are you going to do between September to December? And what are you going to do in 2021? Our brain is a lovely, beautiful um, space. The best thing about the mind is it needs to be reaffirmed. And the way we reaffirm our mind is not only thinking and speaking the work, it's writing the work because our mind and our heart is connected. And when we write down our intentions, it's magical how our, our heart just feels that. And all of a sudden, what became a floating in idea and thought becomes grounded and certain. And so that's why we really encourage you to use this document to write down what you're going to do today, tomorrow, and moving forward, because when you do that, you're connecting your heart and your mind and you're being resolute in the actions you want to take and you have a higher chance of acting on it. And that's how we sustain this work. This did not happen overnight, but this is that moment. This is that time where we own that we are awake and that we want to be a part of the solutions. And so let's do that. Let's affirm that by using this um, document as a way to map out our plan for change. Beautiful. So both on Facebook Live and in the Zoom, you should be seeing a link to that Google Doc, which you can download and fill out as many times as you need to for your own self. Um, we as a Center for Community and Nonprofit Studies, along with our colleagues at the Mortgage Center and with Annette at Equity by Design, want to make sure that we think about ways to carry forward supporting you all as you work on your individual action plans. And we know that having groups to hold each other accountable for this work and to find support for this work is one way that we could make that a little bit easier for everybody. So we're talking about that and thinking about that. And we encourage you to send us your suggestions for that in the chat. Um, but now what I wanna do is turn it over to um, Felicia and Lisa, if they're willing to share a little bit about just ending this session together on, what does it look like once you do engage in this journey and you realize you're in it for the long haul. How do you keep the work going? How does the work evolve? Even if you're just starting on the simplest level, how do you make sure you can stay in it and keep advancing through it and making meaningful contributions? So Felicia, maybe I'll start with you. And then when you're ready, you can hand off to Lisa. And you realize you're in it. Well, it helps if I unmute, doesn't it? How does the work evolve? Um, sustaining the work, staying in it for the long haul. I believe that we have heard many of the speakers in the conversation today share bits and pieces um, of what is required to stay in the work for the long haul. But I would have to tell you that um, there are a few essential things. One is the education. One is the education. 
And next is building the infrastructure to do the work and having an advocacy and action plan. Um, so for the education component, there are a couple of things that I would like to share. After the Ferguson uprising, everyone, well, most people know that there was a Ferguson commission and we um, spent a year and a half of research with experts <clears throat> around the globe and um, people here in St. Louis, over 3000 people participated in the process to create this document for the Ferguson, a pathway to racial equity. And this is not about Ferguson, Missouri. This is about addressing inequities in black and brown communities anywhere in America. I promise you, if you pick up that document, the Ferguson Commission report forward through Ferguson, there are nearly 200 calls to action in that document. It is full of resource, resources. It will direct you exactly where you need to go and then it's gonna tell you who you should hold accountable across critical areas to heal community. So police reform, youth at the center, my body of the work, economic mobility, um, justice reform. If there is an issue <laughs> that you would like to work on, let that be your first point of reference. Because it wasn't just you know, us here in St. Louis, um, most of the commissioners, activists, community organizers, um, but it was a deeply diverse group of people. We didn't just come up with this by ourselves, right? So people participated from all over the globe to give us the best research you can trust this work. It will apply to where you are. So that's the education, having that resource. Um, and before the commission sunset, yeah, I've been started thinking like, man, this is a really powerful tool. How are we gonna get this done? Understanding that community did not have the capacity to lift that work from the pages. We needed someone looking at this every day and doing this every day. And we looked across our strong nonprofits and our, our um, other places, hoping that we could leave it with them and that they could keep in care for it and, and continue to make progress on it. And soon learned that no, there wasn't an entity <laughs> available to place this. And so we did what we said we weren't gonna do, which was create a nonprofit called Forward Through Ferguson, talented group of committed young people um, that get up every single day thinking about advancing racial equity. Not only that, having developed tools so that we can track it to understand where the progress is and where it isn't. We're not interested in what you're talking about. We're interested in what you're doing and how it's progressing and how it's impacting people. So having the infrastructure in place is critical. It is critical. <clears throat> and then advocacy, you have to keep talking about it, have to keep talking about it. People didn't wanna talk about it. They just didn't wanna hear it. Um, so the commission's work and then go to Ford through Ferguson, I think it's .org um, and, and check that out and see what they're doing. And then I have to lift up a group, my family, the Ferguson Collaborative, the Ferguson Collaborative, because it's really exciting. We were all in the streets. We wanted the consent decree. We needed something to say, yes, we're not hallucinating. These tremendous historic um, traumas and abuses have been heaped on our communities for centuries and we needed to stop. So documenting that and then having the Department of Justice come in and do their report um, and give us, um, grant the consent decree. And so we're in a contract with the federal government to transform policing. Um, and this is when it gets to the not so fun, non-sexy stuff that nobody's talking about. But it is reviewing all of the policies of policing and community deciding and des designing a structure for public safety that doesn't include all of the crazy things that cops are doing 
manner of walking and those the foolish things that aren't keeping us safe, but our increasing contact with police that often turn in our community to um, brutalization and murder. So we're trying to stop contact with police. How do we train the police? How do we train the police? Um, so it's it's around use of force, uh, First Amendment protection, de-escalation, um, um, anti-bias training. So we're working along with the Department of Justice and we have a monitor, we go to court, um, we have an opportunity to speak and this is when your advocacy part comes in as community members, you've got the federal government as a party and you've got C.D. Ferguson as a party, but this is about us. So we show up at the consent decree hearings, we give testimony, we write the judge, um, we're creating a community-based record um, for the consent decree process. Now, it was really hard. People were like, you got the consent decree, what are you gonna do? Well, it's a lot of very tedious work that we've been doing since it was signed, putting together a neighborhood policing steering committee, structuring a civilian, um, a citizen review board, civilian review board, um, having a human rights commission in place, activating all of these things on the ground, making sure that they're populated, making sure that they're supported, making sure that people know what's happening, that we're getting this information, getting community engaged. It's very difficult work. Why? Because people were tired. They just came off the street. And not only that, they came off the street and met a new administration and a D um, Department of Justice where the AG Sessions came in 12 days after he was um, appointed. He said, we're not doing that civil rights work anymore. And what that did was send a signal out to police departments across the country that this work isn't important. The federal government does not support these communities. They're not putting their time, their research, or their money into reforming police departments and saving, serving and saving communities. And you see what that got us. That's why we're here now because the progress that some communities had been making in partnership with the Department of Justice that cared about the civil rights of violated and vulnerable communities to this DOJ that said, we're not gonna do that. And so police department's like, we can just do whatever we want. There's, there's no accountability for us. And we see where we are in this moment. And so I wanna thank the members of the Ferguson Collaborative. I wanna thank Forward Through Ferguson. I wanna thank others in our community, Arc City Defenders. You know, people just haven't stopped. I wanna thank our partners at um, the um, Advancement Project for always helping us with, you know, with research and, <clears throat> and helping to design policies and bringing us things, um, um, best practices and next practices from around the country where they're working with community organizations on the ground, advancing this diversity, inclusion and equity work. So you have to have the education, you have to have the infrastructure and you have to have an advocacy and action plan. And how do you sustain it? Recognize that it is difficult, it is hard, the winds, they're, they're difficult to get, it's, they're tiny, and you're going to have to keep on pushing. So one of the things that has been helpful for us as a collaborative is recognizing that self-care and that community care component. That every time we get together, we're talking about policies, we're always at the city council meetings, we, we have all these other um, meetings to do this very tedious, um, difficult work and then realizing sometimes we just need to get together and talk about something that isn't racial equity mm -hmm. because racial battle fatigue is real. Mm -hmm. Racial battle fatigue is real. And if you don't care for yourself and realize that you're in an ongoing struggle, that is going to be difficult mentally, spiritually, physically. I've seen families come apart. Families are falling apart. Divorce, um, it, it's fracturing communities in, in strange ways, but I remain, I remain hopeful. I, re, I remain hopeful. And you have to be patient. I'm not good at being patient. That's something that I'm learning. 
You have to be patient because there, there's a, a revelation of, of racism that people um, need time to steep themselves in because it's a lot. It's a lot. You know, like you said, you got PhDs in history. They don't know anything about Black history. They think Black people started with slavery. I mean, how ridiculous is that? I met a young woman. She's got a PhD in literature. She never heard of James Baldwin. I mean, what? How, how legitimate is that degree? Seriously. And so we have to think about these things and ask these questions because for me, that's an impossibility. So there's a revelation of racism to understanding racism. And we have to be patient while people get that. And um, they, they, need, they need time and there's gonna be resistance, right? You're always gonna face the resistance. I'm not a racist, I didn't do it. What is this system? I'm not in the system, I'm not complicit. So people are going to resist, they're going to struggle. They're really going to struggle and you have to be empathetic, but you know, it's just not my responsibility to do your work. You're gonna to have to do your own work. I have to care for me, you care for you, and then together we can be stronger together but it's not my responsibility. And I think for a lot of white folks, they are just in the position where whenever they were in trouble, people rush to them and give them the resources and prop them up and take care of their fragility. But you know what? We're fragile and we need support and bolstering and care. I just have to say that. I just have to say, it's time for y'all to do some white foot work. Yes. It's and important. It's and important. That's how we sustain this, this work and reflect on this new knowledge. Just, mm -hmm. just reflect on it. I know it's hard to believe that you've got this fabulous education from this very esteemed institution and you have a lot of learning to do. But you gotta spend some time and reflect on it and think about the world that, 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 you, that you want. And it, then you will begin the process of revealing for yourself, for your family, for your community, what the possibilities and opportunities are. And that is what is so exciting. That's so, so exciting. Because here in Ferguson, we had a lot of experience with organizing and protesting, right? And so these years later, some of those young people, they were 15, 16 years old, they're emerging young adults. They knew what to do. They knew what to do, step back and give them the opportunity to lead, lead from the back, let them exercise those muscles. They will inherit this world. So give them an opportunity to help design it and start their leadership journey here, right? With the, with the tools and, and, and support. So um, while we have a lot to do, I am immensely, and I'm, I'm so hopeful, I'm almost joyful <laughs> about the moment that we're in, tragic as it is, to see and understand and have it confirmed that there is a revelation and that it, it does take time. It does take time because people have been sitting in this and in St. Louis, we've been doing a lot of work over the course of these years. And that is why when that is why you see um, white people and influential people organizing protest in their communities where the tanks and tear gas would have met any protest to protect those spaces. But they're in the street organizing their community to say, we don't wanna participate in this. We know what systemic and institutionalized racism is. I don't want to be a racist. I understand I'm a racist. I want to do some anti-racism work. We welcome you. We understand we're on board. It takes time. It, it, it takes time. Felicia, I just want to thank you for really helping us understand how a, a community such as yours who's been grappling with this, um, helping us understand that it's hard work but it's work that can lead to change. And I appreciate you giving us both the bitter and the sweet of that. Thank you so, so much. I'm wondering if Lisa, uh, if you would have some words that you wanna add to this um, in terms of helping us understand. Oh, yes, I really do. I'm, I'm very uh, encouraged by the conversation 
and the thoughts and words that I've heard today in this uh, panel in this group. Um, and I, I agree 100% with Felicia in you know education adv advocacy action plan and how does that look you know as a Native American educator American Indian educator. Um, you know, I can't begin to say enough, you know, how important education is, you know, for American Indian people, it, it, this is not just a black issue. It's not just, um, you know, it is a people of color issue when you really get down to the nuts and bolts of our communities. Um, our, all of our communities were affected in this and continue to be affected. And, you know, as for American Indian people, it's been over 500 years of oppression by law enforcement by um, military, you know, and even when we look at talk about education, Minnesota here prior to the last standard review, um, I believe it was 2010 prior to that or 2008, the Minnesota standard for social studies for American Indians, um, it didn't even uh, give any credit to any American Indian or indigenous people here in the, in the continent um, pre-contact, you know, the standards started at post-contact, like there was nobody here, right? So education, and we can't wait, you know, as, as she talked about how um, we need to educate those officers, we need to train, but we can't wait till they're running out the door with the diploma in hand and say, wait a minute, we have some things you need to learn about our communities of color here. Um, that education needs to start early on. It needs to start in our school systems. It needs to continue on. There has to be better than one class of your diversity class required for um, to graduate with your four-year degree or whatever the requirements are for um, law enforcement. Or I, I remember in teachers, I think it was like one differentiation in, in uh, diversity class that was required. One class, really. Um, so that's it that's coming up, you know, it has become an issue on a national level through um, the illuminative group where they did an invis invisibility study and looked at all levels of civil society and who knew or understand treaties, who knew and understand American Indian family structures. Do those judges, do those social workers, do those um, counselors, do they truly understand our family unit, you know, they, and they don't, you know, and, and my uncle uh, calls them uh, scholastically deficit, you know, that we have these people in these high positions, decision makers, policy makers that really have no clear understanding of our true culture, our people, our family, our, our community. And so I, I'm really stand there with Felicia and, and, and saying that education is a key component. And we, and again, not just handing it as they're running out the door. Um, and here in Minneapolis, there was an issue of, there was some American Indians that were taken, were picked up by the police and taken downtown. And when they arrived downtown at the, the police just brought them to the hospital emergency room to drop them off. But you know where they had them in the car? Can you guess in the trunk? And you know, yeah, that won a big lawsuit. But at that time, you know, something that Mr. Danley said earlier from Camden, he said, you know, you have to keep pressuring, you have to keep it going, otherwise it slips back, you know, two steps forward, one step back. And at that time, Minnesota came up with a citizens review panel and we had a process. We came up with that community process, we came up with that response to the police interaction. And what happened to it? The leadership change in the city, gone, nothing. It's, it's in somebody's file cabinet somewhere, I'm guessing. You know, so the work that we are talking about having to do now has been done. So, you know, pull that puppy out of the drawer and let's start because we have a working format and framework that we can move forward with. But as he said, we have to keep on it. You have to keep pressuring. So just because this one fight might be you think the dust is beginning to settle, don't let it settle, keep it going. So that's what I say. And I thank you so much for this opportunity to be part of this panel. Yes, thank you so much. Perfect ending. I think we've heard some incredible themes that relate to this question of sustainability that we have to stay persistent even when we have what might look like a win 
the education and a 360 view on our history are so important throughout the process. And there are lots of different roles we can play, but we have to stay well and we have to support each other. So um, we're 15 minutes over, but, and I thank all of you that are being patient with us, but after you've seen this amazing dream team of experts, I think you understand why we got a little over ambitious about packing it in. We're gonna do this again on Tuesday of next week at noon, and we're probably gonna have most of the same speakers, but we're gonna have others too, some trade outs. Um, so join us again, and please send us your comments in Facebook or Zoom about how you'd like to see the Center for Community and Nonprofit Studies with its collaborators continue to sustain your action plan and the way that you might wanna connect with others in your action plan. We are open to your suggestions. We're gonna fight to find the resources and support that we need to do what we can. Um, and um, finally, we will ask our panelists for their permission to post their names and um, maybe their social media contact information on our Facebook page so that you can find ways to connect with them and their organizations. So um, that's what I've got. Annette, thank you so much for being such a pro uh, facilitator from Equity by Design. Um, anybody got any last shout outs before we call it a day? I just wanna thank everybody for being on. This, this is how we start the work. This is action, so let's keep it moving. Absolutely. We'll see you in the continued journey. Thank you all so much for giving of your time. We hope you're inspired to move forward. Stay in touch. Thank you so much.